Hello, everyone, from wherever you're joining. Thank you so much for being here today for this NCAR Explorer series lecture. What can satellites tell us about the quality of the air we breathe with Dr. Helen Warden and Dr. David Edwards? My name is Dr. Dan Zietlow, and I'm an education specialist here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, which is a world leading organization dedicated to understanding our system science. And that includes our atmosphere, climate, weather, the sun, and the importance of all of these systems to our society. I'm really glad y'all could be here today to learn more about how scientists like Helen and David use satellites to study air quality and the air that we breathe. So for this event, we'll be taking questions at the end of the lecture, but please definitely submit any questions you might have uh, throughout the talk using the Slido platform. So if you scroll down the webpage just a little bit, you can see the Slido window just below where you were seeing the live stream video of this event. Go ahead and click the green join event button if you haven't already, and that way you can ask questions on the Q&A tab and answer poll questions on the polls tab. And definitely be sure to join Slido to add your thoughts to our word cloud question that's going on right now. What do you think contributes to our air quality? Because we're gonna get to that really soon. This lecture is also going to be recorded and will be available on the NCAR Explorer series website. So with us today, we have NCAR scientists, Dr. Helen Warden and Dr. David Edwards. Dr. Warden is a scientist in the Atmospheric Chemistry Observations and Modeling Lab, or ACOM. And since 2016, she has led the team for the NASA EOS Terra satellite instrument called MOPIT, which has been observing global distributions of carbon monoxide for 21 years. The program provides a fully characterized long-term archive of satellite observations of atmospheric carbon monoxide that can be used to study changes in atmospheric chemistry and emissions of pollution. Dr. Edwards is also a scientist in ACOM, and he has 30 years of experience working on satellite mission design and development to investigate pollutant trace gas and aerosol seasonal variations and global distributions. Of particular interest is the integration of measurements from different observational platforms using chemical transport models. And Dr. Edwards has worked on the development of the new international satellite constellation, whose goal of achieving continuous observational coverage of atmospheric composition is about to be realized. Uh, and so with that, Helen and David, could you give a quick hello and then maybe we'll check out the answers to our work cloud. Hi. Hey everyone, I'm Helen. And I'm David. Awesome. So Paul, can you throw up that work cloud for us? Cool, so right away I'm seeing cars, planes, fires, uh, smoke, wildfires, air pollution, climate change, unclear policy, uh, PM or particulate matter, VOCs or volatile organic uh, compounds, uh, airplanes, human activity. So I'm seeing a lot of, of general themes uh, on our word cloud, uh, Helen and David. Do you have any thoughts on that before you dive into your lecture? I think this is great. This is some of the things that we're going to talk about. So uh, hopefully the folks who put these uh, words up there, they're going to hear some answers. Yeah, and I think uh, just looking out the window, we can see some effect from fires. So that's obviously on everyone's mind right now. Awesome, thanks Paul. And I'm stoked to hear uh, y'all's talk. All right. Okay, are we sharing our, is everything good? Sure. We're trying something a little new today. So, so bear with us if you're sitting at home. <laughs> yeah, just, um, um, I think it's, yeah. Yeah, that button didn't pop up like it should have. <laughs> I see. There we are. Here we go. We're going to then present. There we are. Awesome. Thank, Thank you very much <laughs> for our technical support. So, uh, our talk today, we're going to for this NCAR Explorer series, we're going to talk about what air, what can satellites tell us about the quality of the air we breathe. I'm David. I'm Helen. And we can jump straight in here. So this talk, we're going to cover a number of different topics, which I hope are going to be interesting to everybody. Uh, the problem, we'll try and define this, air pollution and what, how it affects us. We'll talk about some of the tools we have, such as computer models, observations, and then describe the role of satellites. 
Uh, we'll then go on to talk about some of the air pollution sources that we see, how this pollution gets moved around in the atmosphere, and how we emiss, estimate the emissions of pollution. And so one, one tiny silver lining of the COVID-19 lockdowns were, um, was the reduction in air pollution. So we're going to talk about what we saw from space in that. And then obviously fires and their effect on air quality is a big issue. Um, and how, how air pollution has changed over time. And then finally, uh, what future satellite observations will tell us about uh, air quality and how we can improve air quality forecasts. So the first of these topics is uh, air pollution and air quality and how this affects us. And we'll jump straight into a very dramatic uh, video. Uh, this was taken by a journalist in Beijing back in 2017, and it just shows how quickly pollution can uh, change the, our environment and really affect our air quality. So you can go from very clean skies one moment to very, very uh, uh, polluted atmosphere the next moment. And this can happen really very quickly. And you go from this to uh, the the pollution and suddenly you can't see the next uh, you can't see the next building over and that depends a lot on the weather too so it does yes yeah. so uh now we're to our first uh quiz in slido um which was what which risk risk factors cause about the same global mortality for women as poor air quality and so if, if we can bring up that uh response from slido yes every a uh, lot of people got that get that right. It was uh, one of those, all of these combined. Um, but those other ones are also very important. And if we go to the next slide, um, just up to, um, we can see that for both men and women, uh, the next button. Um, it contributes globally to 6.7 million premature deaths per year and about 100,000 or more in the US. And it also causes crop damage, which has a significant impact on food security. So that's over 1 billion per year. But going back to the uh, global burden of disease, this is the most recent assessment of risk factors for women. And you can see that air pollution is the fourth highest uh, risk, if you go to there. and. Um, with the different colors on there showing the resulting diseases. So the, the highest one is cardiovascular disease. Um, and that's really the highest for a lot of those risk factors. Um, but also important for air pollution is chronic respiratory disease. So those all um, are important uh, health effects from air pollution. So how do we understand and predict air quality? Helen's described how uh, this is definitely important for our health. And as scientists, some of the uh, questions that we're wanting to ask are relatively straightforward. What are the sources and processes that emit pollution? What are the chemical and physical transformations that take place in the atmosphere? And how does this uh, pollution move around in the atmosphere and how does it affect the air we breathe? However, although these are fairly straightforward questions, getting the answers, as you might guess, is a little more evolved. And also we have some challenges, some particular questions that we're interested in answering. For instance, observing, modeling, and predicting air composition in both the developed and the developing world, understanding the interactions between natural and also human-driven emissions, and quantifying the impacts of extreme fires, such as uh, extreme events, such as fires uh, and, and heat waves, obviously a, a topic of great interest right now. So what do we need to measure to understand air quality? So we have a list here of the EPA criteria pollutants, and these are from primary production. So they're produced directly from uh, sources on the, on the ground. And the pollutants in yellow are the ones that we can measure from space. So we have sulfur dioxide, which is from burning of coal and oil, nitrogen oxides, which come from high temperature combustion, carbon monoxide from incomplete combustion. And that's something David and I have studied a lot. So we'll be talking about that a lot, but it's um, just so you know, it's the same toxic carbon monoxide that you would monitor in your home, but not at such high concentrations outside. Um, but it's very important for atmospheric chemistry. And then there's particulate matter that you've probably heard about, and uh, especially PM 2.5 is dangerous to human health. And they're direct sources from smoke and dust. But then there's the things that are made uh, from secondary production in the atmosphere, 
Um, and those are like ground level ozone, which is very toxic to humans. Um, and then also uh, more particulate matter from sulfates, sulfate and nitrate in organic aerosols. So to put a little bit more detail on this, we can talk about the complex chemistry of air pollution right? uh, in not too much detail, but we'll just give you a, a flavor here. So Helen talked about some of the emissions and from, especially from cities and urban activity, we might have SO2 and uh, nitrogen oxides, which we call NOx. These come from, as Helen mentioned, uh, high combustion, high, high temperature combustion sources. Then there are some uh, pollutants that we get from a mixture of sources. There could be ammonia, which comes from agricultural processes as well as uh, uh, industrial emissions and methane, which comes from uh, potentially from oil and gas exploration, but also from livestock. Then we have a whole uh, whole set of different chemicals called volatile organic compounds. And these are often big molecules that are emitted, uh, uh, could be from industrial processes or from urban processes, but also from natural vegetation. Then we have the carbon monoxide that we get from incomplete combustion and also primary aerosol. These are the little particles that come, uh, come out of fires, for instance, uh, often carbon based. These things all get into the atmosphere and uh, they all mix together and give a good dose of sunlight, which drives a lot of the chemical reactions that we get. Then we get some cooking of other chemicals. Uh, most notably amongst these is ozone. Uh, the locus is ozone uh, down in towards the surface of the atmosphere to be distinguished from the ozone high up in the stratosphere that protects, protects us from the sun's uh, UV radiation. And we also get secondary aerosol. This uh, sulfur dioxide, for instance, can get oxidized in the atmosphere and it produces sulfate particles, uh, which are, uh, have a big impact uh, both uh, on the chemistry and health, but also on climate. Uh, so observations can help. If we can make some um, observations of a lot of these different uh, compounds, uh, we can get a handle on where they are and where they're coming from. And this helps us to uh, understand some of these processes that we talked about before, the emissions, the chemical and physical transformations, and the transport that we're interested in. So that brings us to our second uh, quiz, and that was a two-parter, which is, which air pollutant has decreased the most since 1990 in the U.S., um, and which has it decreased the least. And so if we can bring up the responses for those. Um, so we have decreased the most. In fact, it was sulfur dioxide. And I don't know if anyone remembers acid rain, but it's uh, that was a big problem in the 90s and we uh, still a problem in other places, but not really in the US. Um, and then if you go to the next one, um, that also, <laughs> yeah, so, so ozone is the one that has decreased the least. So sulfur dioxide has decreased the most and ozone has decreased the least. And we'll see that in the next uh, graph of trends from the EPA. So this is uh, EPA air pollution trends since 1990. And you can see the green line, There's, I'm sorry for all the lines on there, but the, the dark blue line is sulfur dioxide. So that's gone down a lot. And then the dark, or the lighter green line is ozone. And so that's all compared to this national standard, which is the dashed line on there. And that's based on health outcomes. And that gets revised as we learn more about uh, pollution sources and attribution. And regulations depend on whether the so sources are local or from other states and other countries. So although we are mostly below that national standard level, ozone is still often in exceedance. And you can see from the next map here that Denver has a high ozone event on this day. Um, this is from the EPA's Air Now site. And uh, Denver and the Front Range have a, a mix of pollution sources from urban, oil and gas, and agriculture, along with a lot, a lot of sunshine. And that can cause these ozone exceedances, along with wildfire smoke. Is, so. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the uh, different tools that we have. And these basically come down to two categories. The first of these is models. Uh, these are computer models that can simulate uh, the atmosphere and pretty much encompass all of our knowledge of what's happening. And they range in, uh, in scale from process models, which really look in the fine detail of what might be happening, say what, uh, what chemicals are coming out of uh, a particular fire, for instance. 
And they range up then to regional models, which are high resolution models over a particular area that can give us some really fine scale information about the chemistry and the weather. And then all the way up to global models, which are the way in which we can add our knowledge of chemistry into the big global simulation models that are used for climate. And we can, it's a way in which we can understand the impact of chemistry on climate. Corresponding to all these different models, we also have observations. And, it, and for the questions that we want to ask about air quality, there's no single observation can uh, give us all the answers. So again, we have to go through uh, uh, observations at different scales. And this ranges all the way from lab studies. And this is where we do uh, observations in a laboratory. Uh, this is a traditional idea that you might have of some person in a white coat with a test tube, all the way up to uh, then we have of, uh, in situ observations where we go out into the uh, environment and take some samples of air. And if we put some of our chemistry instruments on an aircraft and fly it around, we can get a larger scale context of some of the local observations we make. But then in this, uh, the right way. Uh, in this talk, we're going to be particularly concentrating on satellite, satellite remote sensing, and I'll explain later what that means. But we're looking at uh, the role of satellites and what they can provide this uh, mix of information. They provide us with the long, long term observations, large scale context for the process uh, observations and modeling that we make, and a regional to global scale coverage. So here's a great example of a high resolution NASA model that shows the complexities of sources and transport for different aerosol types. So in the northern hemisphere, you have a lot of sulfate and nitrate aerosols from human activity. Um, but then you also have uh, some carbonaceous aerosols coming off of the burning in Africa and South America and some dust coming off of the Sahara. So this model includes everything we know about sources, chemistry, and transport. So if we see large discrepancies with observations, we use that information to improve the model. And now we're gonna get into the more specific role of satellites in all of this. So uh, we've now benefited from more than two decades of a golden age of observations from satellites of atmospheric composition. And David and I have both uh, benefited from uh, our careers in that. We've uh, really had a lot of good data to, to look at. And these satellite instruments have characterized pollution sources, transport and variability on weekly to monthly and regional to global scales. The instruments have lasted way past their design lifetimes, which are usually like five to six years, and now give insight into atmospheric composition trends. And the long-term records uh, have also allowed new analysis techniques to detect small signals. But we're entering now a new era of higher spatial and temporal resolution observations that will let us access local, regional, and hourly scales. So in addition to some of the planetary probes you've heard about, like the missions to Mars, NASA also has a lot of uh, satellites that observe different aspects of the Earth system. So the atmosphere, the surface, oceans, ice. And on the bottom, you can see the, the missions that are in orbit now, and then the ones in yellow are being formulated. So the question is on your mind is probably how from satellite do we look at the atmosphere and how do we measure pollution in the atmosphere when we're some uh, 600 kilometers above the Earth's surface? Well, we're not driving the satellite through the atmosphere and getting out and actually taking a sample of the air. What we use is a uh, technique out of physics called spectroscopy. And I'm just going to walk you through this, uh, uh, hopefully not too in a too complicated manner. So coming out of the sun, we have radiation. And as everybody probably knows, we have uh, the radiation that we see, uh, the white light that coming from, from the sun is actually made up of all the colors of the rainbow and a few more. Uh, on the longest wavelength side, we have infrared radiation. On the short wavelength side, we have the ultraviolet radiation, which we have to protect ourselves from uh, in the case of sunburn, for instance. Uh, this comes down into the atmosphere and the atmospheric gas molecules absorb this radiation at very specific uh, signature wavelengths. And you might ask, well, why, why specific wavelengths? Well, this is quantum mechanics. And that these wavelengths correspond to the same energy that, that is needed to make the, uh, the bonds that exist between the atoms of the molecule vibrate. And so here's a, uh, an example, here's a little picture here of a CO2 molecule and the uh, atoms are vi vibrating. So we take the uh, radiation 
after that, we observe it with a satellite and a satellite instrument that is capable of separating out all the different radiation wavelengths. Now, this is shown schematically here by a prism uh, separating out the white light into all its components. But we have lots of in uh, different instrumentation that can uh, perform essentially the same uh, function of separate, separating out the, the different wavelengths. And what we end up after that is a transmission spectrum, which shows the absorption of the signature wavelengths of each particular gas. So in this particular figure, we can see water vapor, ozone, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide, and the particular absorption features that they produce. And so what we can do is to look at uh, the amount of absorption of each of these gases, and it gives us an indication of how much of the different gases were actually present. So how do we make a measurement? Well, as I said, we are often using radiation from the sun and it comes down through the atmosphere. And as it does that, it passes through the atmosphere and absorption takes place by these molecules at these signature wavelengths I talked about before. We get a reflection at the Earth's surface and it bounces back up to the satellite. But as it does so, it passes through the atmosphere once again and we have more radiation absorbed again at these signature wavelengths of each particular gas in the atmosphere. Now, at the same time, uh, the short wave radiation that I've talked about from the sun is joined by long wave radiation that's emitted from the Earth's surface. And uh, this passes also up through the atmosphere where it's joined by some emission uh, uh, from the atmosphere, again, at these specific wavelengths characteristic of the particular gases that we have. It reaches the satellite and the uh, satellite instrument uh, it detects the radiation, spreads it out, separates the wavelengths, and then uh, looks at the amount of absorption in, in, each of, in each of these spectral signatures in order to come up with an idea of how much gas there was. So now once we have this spectrum as measured by the satellite, um, we have a process where we want to infer the amount of gas in the atmosphere, and that's what we call the retrieval. So what we want is the information about the distribution of the gas. And what we have is this satellite observation, as well as some other important information about meteorology and surface properties that affect the measurements. And what we think we know are the factors that determine the signal that reaches the satellite. So the gas and the particle absorption, the emission and scattering and the effect of clouds, the surface properties for emission and reflection, and then how the instrument processes that. And that gives us this forward model, which is basically another spectrum of the absorption in the atmosphere. But we also uh, need to have prior information or a first guess about what we think is in the atmosphere. And that's like the average gas distribution. So you can see a, a picture of that, which varies with latitude. And then what we do is um, uh, an inverse process to obtain the optimal estimate of the gas amount and the distribution that's consistent with the new measurement and our prior knowledge of the atmosphere. And that gives us the, the picture there on the bottom, um, which is a new estimate of the gas amount and the distribution. And this was for a day with uh, fires uh, last, last year. So you can see a pretty spectacular signature from those fires uh, that was not there in the prior. And that information on the, uh, also gives us uh, some uncertainties of the estimate and the, a measurement of the vertical sensitivity. So we promise the physics lesson is over now and uh, everything from here on out will be a little easier. Uh, uh, but we want to talk about, especially about this instrument called uh, MOPIT. Um, this is, uh, stands for, it's a funny name, but it stands for Measurement of Pollution in the Troposphere and it was launched back in 1999. So it's on the Terra satellite and now we have uh, over 20 years of observations from this satellite. Now, I was lucky enough to be the one to make the very first uh, global retrieval of carbon monoxide in the, in the atmosphere, as shown in this uh, newspaper cutting from back in 2000. Um, it was very exciting for myself as a young scientist at the time, having worked on the design of this instrument, uh, to see something that no one had ever seen before from space. It was kind of a eureka moment for me in my career. And back then, we didn't exactly understand all these pollution patterns that you can see in this. We didn't know what quite what those red marks were. And I remember bringing together a lot of observationalists and modelers here at NCAR to try and make sure we understood exactly what it was and to come to the conclusion that it was due to uh, uh, vegetation burning in Africa. And it's something that's something we'll talk about later. So uh, these are some of the other um 
few of the other missions and measurements that we've been involved with. Um, so you have Terra, Aqua, and Aura, which are the EOS missions from NASA, and then some of the European missions, and we sat Metop A and Sentinel 5P. So, um, and, and this shows the ultraviolet, the shortwave, and the thermal uh, molecules that are, are detected from these. And then um, along with that, we use some other Earth system remote sensing information to, to make our observations. So TROPOMI on Sentinel 5P um, is a relatively new satellite instrument and is a follow on from OMI on Aura. And it has very good spatial resolution and that, that allows us to see finer details than before. So on the, on the left of that picture, you have the OMI uh, NO2 observations at about 13 times 24 kilometers spatial resolution. And you can see things are sort of blobby. But then on the right, you have uh, TROPOMI, which now has 3.5 by 7 kilometer spatial resolution. And you can really see that we're, we can pinpoint uh, pollution sources a lot better. So this was uh, built by our Dutch colleagues and uh, launched by the European Space Agency. And now uh, to continue with TROPOMI, we're now looking at um, TROPOMI carbon monoxide observations. And this is a good example of validation. And validation is how we determine the accuracy of our observations from space. TROPOMI was able to make useful observations right after launch in part because of existing satellite instruments like MOPIT that it could compare to. So we make comparisons with known measurements such as those on aircraft. And this global map shows the TROPOMI CO data for the 24th of April to 21st of May, the year after uh, TROPOMI launched. The circles show aircraft profiles that are converted to total columns that are then compared to TROPOMI. And these are from the ATOM4 field campaign. And you can see that uh, the circles really match the map pretty well. The difference is, is hard to see sometimes because the agreement is very good. So now we get into the sorts of orbits that we're gonna talk about. Uh, we have the low earth orbit. And these are polar orbits shown on the left. And they're at about 800 kilometers or about with about 100 minutes per orbit and around 14 orbits a day. So these give you a day and night view, but always a snapshot at the same time of day for any one location. And then in the animation on the right, we have a geostationary orbit, which is around 36,000 kilometers and rotates with the Earth so that it stares at the full disk centered on the same location all the time. So we need observations from both of these orbit types for understanding weather and air quality, since these are all transported globally, as we see by the polar orbits on the left, but also change over the day. Like a, a good example is rush hour traffic, and that you can see um, from the geostationary orbits on the right. So the geostationary uh, perspective has already made huge improvements to weather forecasts. And it, uh, we've gone from like a skill of three to four days to about 10 days out because of that. So the next part of this talk, we're going to talk about, we're going to do a digital survey about some of the different pollution sources that we expect to be able to measure and also look at the transport of some of this pollution in the atmosphere. And what I mean by that is we've often seen, um, we've all seen areas, say, in a, over a city where the air quality is really bad. You can't see the, the uh, buildings in front of you. Uh, it's really not pleasant to be out and, and, and trying to breathe that. And we can see this from space. Here's an example of a picture from, uh, from Moppet. And you can see over China, very high levels of uh, carbon monoxide pollution, which is characteristic of this whenever we have this incomplete combustion taking place. But what I want to point out here is that this doesn't stay over China. It then gets moved uh, by the prevailing meteorology, by the winds. It gets blown out into the Pacific Ocean and crosses the Pacific Ocean in plumes that we can detect from space uh, before uh, getting, reaching uh, as far away as the, um, uh, the next continent over, in this case, the United States. Now looking at these newer observations of carbon monoxide from Tropomi, um, we can see every frame here is a, is a day, and you can see the, the pollution transport that David was talking about. So we have the sources from African biomass burning and South American biomass burning that are, are transported uh, mostly, mostly eastward. Um, then there's pollution from China and also fires in Siberia, and that gets uh, transported all, ac all, around, all across the globe. Another thing that we can do is to monitor and detect different pollutants from space. And here's an example for ash detection. 
and uh, there was a, a volcano erupted in Iceland back in 2010, called Eyjafjall, and this uh, resulted in so much uh, pollution taking place and coming down, ash pollution coming down over Europe, that uh, because there's a lot of fear about uh, the, the effect of ash in jet engines, all the planes were grounded during this uh, this time. Now, our colleagues in uh, our colleagues in France and Belgium came up with a way in in which they could monitor and detect and track this pollution uh, as it as it came down. And this this figure here shows the uh, distribution of the ash at different times during the day. And since that time, this uh, capability has been developed even further to produce uh, a, an early warning system that can be accessed by air traffic control, by uh, airlines, etc., so that they can avoid these plumes or not decide to not fly altogether. All and so next we're going to talk about um, ammonia, the sources of ammonia, which has a weak spectral signature in the infrared. And ammonia is produced um, from agricultural, domestic, and industrial activities for human-produced ammonia. And it's important because it not only impacts air quality, but it also affects uh, lakes and oceans through acidification and eutrophication. And eutrophication is the lack of oxygen and water from too many nutrients that is sometimes caused by fertilizer runoff. And you can see the, the primary sources for human activities are agriculture, which is fertilization mostly, uh, uh, livestock, um, and then industry and fires are also important. So as Helen has mentioned, this is a very important, uh, very important pollutant for us to be able to measure, but it's also very difficult because it has a very, very uh, weak uh, spectral signature, one of those uh, characteristic sign spectral signatures I was talking about before. And so again, our friends in uh, France and Belgium have developed a uh, technique using their IASI instrument, where they can average over very long periods of time and gradually uh, build up enough information so they can get a, a handle on where the sources are and what emissions are taking place. So uh, in this figure, I'm showing an example from the Nile Valley in Egypt. And this is a buildup over a long period of time of very difficult measurements to make. That's one day, two days, three days, a week, a month, a year. And by the time you get to 10 years, we can start to see exactly where the emissions are taking place. Uh, we can go on to derive these emissions, and it gives us a handle on uh, what pollution sources are taking place. And just a, a, an example of another valley, but one close to home, is the San Joaquin Valley in California. And as you know, this is where a lot of our fruits and vegetables are grown, but it's also where a lot of fertilizer is used. And so we can see large amounts of ammonia uh, accumulating over this, uh, over this area. And this is important for air quality and also has climate effects. All right, so now we're gonna talk about uh, nitrogen dioxide, NO2. And if you remember, recall that nitrogen dioxide is produced from high temperature combustion. So it provides a very good indication of industry and transportation activity. And this is an annual, a 2019 annual average from Tropomi. And so these observations, you can see all the major urban areas, but you can also see uh, some of the transportation corridors. So this is a highway map, and you can see on the West Coast, especially that a lot of the features uh, uh, match exactly the, the highway map. And now um, we've been talking about sources and concentrations, but we need to uh, estimate emissions, so something like tons per day, because these are the things we can actually regulate and control. And so uh, if you look at the sources of some of the pollutants we've been talking Talking about, you have biomass burning, fossil fuel combustion, and then some of the natural sources. And we have to be able to separate all of those. So we do that with um, a, a process called uh, inverse, another inverse algorithm. And this is with a chemical transport model. So we start with prior emissions, and those are things like uh, inventories from the EPA. We have our concentration observations from satellite, and then we could also use aircraft and surface. And that gets combined with uh, meteorology. So we have to know how the winds and everything moved around. And so if you go with a, a forward model, you go from the emissions to concentrations. But for an inverse algorithm, you go from concentrations back to emissions. And those estimated emissions are, are an update that give us the best fit to the data. So this is an example for uh, um, nitrogen, well, nitrogen oxide emissions. And it's using uh, data from the OMI instrument. 
And on the left, you have prior emissions. And on the right, you have the updated emissions. And then the bottom shows the change from the prior. So if it's red, it means that uh, it's increased with respect to the prior. And if it's blue, it's decreased. And an, a good example of that, uh, that you can see right off the bat is uh, some of the shipping tracks. Uh, so there were actually more shipping emissions than um, in, the, in the updated emissions than we expected from the original inventory. And so now what do we see from space during the COVID lockdowns? Well, this was a really, uh, um, obviously it wasn't very pleasant to have lockdowns, et cetera, but for chemists, it gave a, a, a natural experiment out in the atmosphere uh, in order to see what happens when uh, reduced activity, uh, human activity, um, results in less emissions into the atmosphere and what it does, effect this has on uh, our air quality. Here's a striking picture. This is from the uh, from New Delhi, showing the India Gate. And normally, uh, Delhi is a um, uh, one of the most uh, polluted uh, cities in the world, in fact. Uh, but you can see in two, uh, November the third of two thousand nineteen, the picture on the left there shows a very polluted atmosphere with very low vis visibility. But during the lockdown period, you can start to see um, very blue skies and uh, much improved, uh, much improved visibility. Now, during this time, the particulate matter, um, the fine fine mode particulate matter, decreased some sixty percent in in Delhi. However, it was very complicated in terms of chemistry because the changes in ozone, which is produced as this semi secondary um, uh, cooked chemical after after it's gone into the atmosphere, after the primary emissions have gone into the atmosphere, uh, are very difficult to predict. And in fact the reductions in the NOx can alter the chemical regime and uh, ozone actually decreased in some of the chemists in some of the cities during the lockdown and of course if we're going to look at differences year to year we also have to account for changing uh, meteorology between one year and the next. So these are some views of East Asia and we point out some of the major cities in China on there and this is um, Tropomi NO2 again and you can see on the left, 2019 uh, as compared to 2020, and then the differences on the right. And so you can see for this uh, pollutant, uh, really it reduced uh, quite a bit because of the lockdown. And it's a little more subtle to see in carbon monoxide. You can see uh, some differences, especially in the cities, but then in Southeast Asia, um, you can see a little bit of an increase. And that was from some of the fires uh, that were larger actually in 2020. And that also um, makes sense in terms of aerosol optical depth. So in the cities, again, this is from MODIS, the MODIS instrument on Terra. And uh, the cities, again, had some, some lower values for aerosols, but uh, fires actually were increased in 2020 in Southeast Asia. So if we look at uh, the US, we saw, again, this same mix of effects due to the lockdown and reductions in uh, emissions due to reduced human activity, and also the mix, the way that this mix is then with emissions from fires and how complicated this can be. So what these two uh, plots show, they show the US and they show uh, carbon monoxide measurements as observed by MOPIP. And they, in both cases, we're, we're contrasting the years uh, 2020 with the COVID uh, year, the 2019, and we're doing this for two different uh, periods, March and April and August and September. Now, in, in March and April, this was the beginning of the lockdown, uh, you can see this uh, quite dramatic, where it's blue here, it shows a, a reduction in pollution. Uh, we see this rather dramatic decrease in pollution, just as uh, Helen was mentioned, mentioning before for, uh, for, for the NOx emissions. But if we look at uh, August and September, we actually see an increase. And uh, this, is, this was again due to the impact of fires, because although human activity had decreased and uh, emissions from this activity had decreased, we had very large fires, especially in uh, California, which produced uh, more pollution than the year before. And so that's why uh, we're seeing this uh, difference shown up as uh, red here. And these satellite measurements actually agreed with what, uh, was, what was observed on the surface. 
This, this map here is showing um, pollution levels on the surface, uh, surface uh, particulate matter, fine scale particulate matter. And if you look to the uh, east coast of the US, you can see things are shown in blue there. That means a, dis uh, a reduction uh, in uh, pollution between uh, 2020 and 2019. And that's in general as a result of this uh, decreased uh, human activity and decreased emissions as a result. However, if we look uh, over towards California and to the West Coast, you can see the uh, large spikes there of more polluted air uh, as a resulting from this, these fires. And so this is an interesting uh, thing that we uh, are interested in looking at from space. Can we separate the influences of uh, fires from the influences of uh, some of these industrial emissions? And so this takes us into our next section where we're going to talk about fires, because I'm sure everybody's interested in uh, some of the pictures that we can see from space as a result of the fires that we've had uh, just recently. So first, some, some quick facts about fires. Um, every year, there's approximately 1.2 billion acres of uh, natural and human induced uh, burning. And uh, that has, of course, a large environmental impact. In the tropical regions, biomass burning occurs annually, and that's for cultivation, deforestation, and savanna grazing. In the Northern Hemisphere, we have burning, but there's a lot of variability from year to year. Um, fires are major pollutant sources. They affect atmospheric chemistry and air quality, and they also have a climate impact. And satellites can help detect the fires and track the smoke plumes as they are transported in the atmosphere. So this picture shows, uh, again, the MODIS uh, instrument on Terra and its fire counts. And these are uh, use observations of long wave heat energy from fires. And so when you see yellow, that's really where the most intense burning is happening. But you can see that it's uh, especially strong in, in um, Africa in this uh, May, 2003, but, uh, but there's really fires everywhere that MODIS can detect. So uh, Helen mentioned these fires in Africa, and this is a thing that we see every year. Uh, every year in the Southern Hemisphere, there are fires in Africa and they gradually move uh, southwards in the continent during the year. And um, also we have uh, indications of fires also in South America. And you can see this, the, the sources of the fires, very, this is showing carbon monoxide again from Tropomi. And, the high the high values uh, indicate the fire regions, but not only do we see the, the pollution over the regions of burning themselves, but we see these plumes that will find their way out into the uh, Atlantic and uh, Indian Oceans um, from the fires. Now, this particular year was uh, this was in, in August of 2019, and it was a year when there was a particularly large fires in uh, South America and in the Amazon, and these were due to um, uh, intense uh, deforestation activities at that time. And it, it came to the uh, national news, if you remember, uh, due to the fact that in some of these cities, such as Sao Paulo, shown here, day turned to night as, as a result of these uh, the emissions and the smoke coming from these fires. Moving now closer to home, uh, we have Western wildfires. And here's a quite dramatic photograph which I actually took last year in Left Hand Canyon here in Boulder and it shows the uh, smoke that this was after the fire had just uh, just started. So our western fire season are at, le at least a couple of months uh, longer than they used to be in the 1970s according to the Forest Service. The uh, Californian fire agency CAL FIRE actually no, con no longer consider those to be a fire season at all because it's an all round a year all year round event. The, large, the number of large fires in the Western United States doubled between 80, uh, 1984 and 2015. And uh, the, the fires are increasing in intensity. The nine largest fires in record have burned since 2005. And as we'll talk about this, it, the air quality is severely affected close to the fires as shown uh, by that huge plume of uh, smoke uh, on, the, on the photograph, but also far downwind. Why are we having more fires? This is a result essentially of drought. Uh, we're having uh, climate changes causing warmer winters, less snowpack, uh, lower precipitation and generally drier conditions. Warmer air temperatures tend to soak up uh, moisture from the surface and uh, the heat waves and drought result in uh, more stressed vegetation, 
which then dies and dries. And uh, it's been noted that the same forests are not growing back after the fires as they used to, just because these fires are so large and so intense now that the burned areas are very, very large indeed. And you've probably read about uh, the effect of fire suppression, uh, the fire management over the last few years, not burning so much of the uh, undergrowth in the, fire, in, uh, in, in the forests, uh, resulting in the availability of a lot of fuel. So if we look at the uh, statistics so far for this year, 2021, total fires have been about 41,000, an area burned is about 4.5 million acres so far. And if you can compare that to the statistics for last year, um, it's quite scary to see that we're on track to be um, meeting the statistics for last year, and we're only in August. And if you remember last year, in 2020, the biggest fires were in California, but they also took place uh, in the fall season. So now we're getting to this year's fires, and we're going to talk first about the Oregon bootleg fire. Um, so. This was a fire so intense it produced its own weather and it burned 646 square miles. And uh, we can see um, what this looked like from space. So this is a satellite view of the bootleg fire burning in Oregon on July 13th. And you can see the flames and the smoke and fire agencies use imagery like this to help in fire management and also firefighting decisions. And satellites can observe that in detail and then track those plumes as they develop to impact air quality far downwind. So this is looking on July 20th um, at the fires. The, there's the California Dixie Fire and the Oregon Bootleg Fire. You can see some of the smoke coming off of them in this image. Um, but we also can look at the carbon monoxide that comes from them and then, then is transported away. And then the aerosol optical depth. And in the blue arrows there show the prevailing uh, transport patterns. So this is what it actually looked like uh, on the ground from those on that day. So we have Denver, uh, New York City and Washington DC. And New York City had the worst air quality in 14 years. And you really shouldn't be able to take a picture of the sun at that height. It's only because of the smoke that they could do that. So now we're getting into how air pollution is changing. And one thing that uh, we're able to do now, as Helen mentioned right at the start, we've had uh, satellite missions, we've had uh, some instruments that have lasted way past their design lifetime. Uh, Moppet was supposed to last for about five years and is now running on uh, uh, 21 years of uh, data. Uh, and we have, in other cases, we have measurements of other gases, such as uh, nitrogen dioxide, NO2, which have been measured by a number of instruments, or each one following on from the last, and this has allowed us to produce very long-term satellite data sets uh, spanning these multiple missions. Uh, this plot here shows uh, trends in tropospheric uh, nitrogen dioxide as measured, uh, as measured over a couple of decades from um, uh, 1996 through to 2017. And where it's shown in blue, this means that pollution has gone down. Where it's shown in red, this means we've had increases in pollution at those times. And as Helen mentioned before, this is nitrogen dioxide. Uh, nit Nitrogen dioxide is produced where we have high temperature combustion taking place. And so this is a really good indication of uh, human activity and where human activity emissions have either gone up or gone down. So you can see that in Europe and Japan and the US, we've got significant reductions uh, during this uh, time. Whereas in some of the developing regions, such as China and India, there have been significant increases. And these pollution amounts and also these trends are very sensitive to environmental policies. And so one of the reasons why, for instance, in the US, we have uh, uh, such significant reductions are the result of uh, the Clean Air Act and the similar policies. Um, and we also were able to see reductions in recessions, etc. Another gas that we're interested in is uh, sulfur dioxide. I mentioned before volcanoes. Well, sulfur dioxide comes from volcanoes, but it's also uh, produced whenever we have uh, fossil fuel burning, especially from coal, for instance. Uh, it's a precursor of secondary sulfate aerosol in the atmosphere, which is important both for health and also has a, a significant climate effect. And what we have now, uh, a long-term uh, 
records of measurements from the OMI satellite uh, shown here, which contrasts the distributions of sulfur dioxide between 2005 and 2016. And so you can see some significant changes in this. Uh, back in 2000. 2005, there were large amounts of sulfur dioxide over China, indicating the use of uh, a large energy production from coal-fired power stations. This has been reduced by uh, 2016 as a result of some improvements in uh, air quality, as a result of um, policy regulations in China. Uh, during the same period, however, you can see in India uh, that uh, we've gone from uh, not very high emissions in 2005 to high emissions in 2016 as a result of the uh, uh, rapid, in, uh, rapid industrialization and growth of, the, of that uh, economy there. And at the time, uh, um, coal-fired power stations accounted for about three quarters of the energy production in, in India. And although uh, there has been a move to cleaner energy uh, in India, uh, coal-fired still power stations still uh, are, are being built, although there is a move to improve uh, uh, the quality of uh, the, the, the scrubbing of the pollutants from these uh, emissions. Uh, moving, having a look at what we can see now with tropomi and when it's very high spatial resolution observations, we can zoom in on particular uh, power stations. And so this gives us a way that we can see exactly Exactly where particular emissions are, are taking place. And this is very useful for working out the efficiency of these power stations and also for regulation. So now we're going to talk about the trend in carbon monoxide as observed from, from Moppet. Moppet has the longest uh, record of, of carbon monoxide from space. And this is a, a convenient way to look at this. So it's a there's year on the x-axis and latitude on the on the y-axis and then amount on the z-axis. And so we have um, the red colors indicate more carbon monoxide. And you can see uh, this gradient from the Southern hemisphere to the Northern hemisphere, as well as the seasonal variation in carbon monoxide. And that's determined by emission sources in photochemistry. And then on the bottom, we have the anomaly and that's uh, 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 taken, you take the top part and you subtract out the record monthly mean. And that lets us see some of these big events that we've been talking about. So that in that anomaly, you can clearly see these uh, Indonesian fires that were driven by the 2015 El Nino conditions, which caused a lot of a uh, huge um, drop in precipitation. So everything dries out. And this um, map on the left shows Moppet observations of the surface. And those are some of the highest ones we'd ever seen with Moppet. Um, you can also see these Australian fires that were really large in the winter of 2019 to 20. Uh, I should say summer for them. And then, uh, and then also some of the 2020 fires that we talked about. And there were also some really large Siberian fires in 2020. So the other thing you can see there is that over the, over the record, we've gone from sort of green colors in that bottom plot to blue colors. And that shows that uh, globally uh, carbon monoxide is declining. And that's primarily due to improved combustion efficiency uh, we remember that carbon monoxide is from um, incomplete combustion. And so as you make things uh, more efficient, then you produce less carbon monoxide. And it's also because of uh, some reduction in the tropical biomass burning, which um, until recently was going down. But as David talked about in 2019, there were some large fires again. So we hope that that trend continues with a reduced biomass burning as well. So we can focus in on uh, a number of regions and showing some of this same data that uh, Helen was talking about, but this time just showing a plot of the uh, seasonal variation of not only the Moppet carbon monoxide measurements, but also the MODIS aerosol measurements. And MODIS is an instrument that flies alongside uh, Moppet on the Terra satellite. And so we have uh, measurements at the same place and at the same time. And we can look, we can compare and contrast these two pollutants uh, during this, this time. And we can see that uh, uh, the Moppet, is, Moppet CO is shown there in red, and uh, we have decreasing CO trends uh, for all regions of, across uh, these two decades. And in the eastern uh, part of the US, we also get reductions in both the aerosol and the carbon monoxide at this time. And this again is a very uh, good indicator of the impact of the strong air quality and climate 
climate related policies that we had in the, in the US. Uh, things that are a little different in China, uh, again, there's a decrease in the amount of uh, carbon monoxide during this time. And it's interesting to see that uh, in the first uh, decade here, shown here, 2000 to 2010, the initial decline in uh, carbon monoxide was not accompanied by a decline in aerosol. In fact, the aerosol increased during this period. And this reflected a move to a centralized energy production that actually improved the combustion efficiency, as Helen was talking about, and reduced the carbon monoxide, but not necessarily the particulate pollution. Uh, back in 2010, China implemented a clean air policy, and the aerosol uh, after that point started to decrease as well, and uh, accompanied the uh, CO in decrease in de decreased amount of pollution in uh, uh, for both of these species. So now we get to how satellite observations inform our daily decisions. For example, should I go outside and exercise today? And uh, some of the some of the uh, most uh, impactful work on this has been done in Europe, and uh, what's showing on this slide is uh, some results from the Copernicus Atmospheric Modeling Service or CAMS, and this is located at the European Centre for Medium Wage Weather Forecast. And what this project has done is to take uh, satellite observations uh, from all the different satellites uh, across the world, including MOPIT, and along with uh, in-situ observations, that's ground-based monitoring of pollutants in different places, and they've integrated these observations in their big uh, weather forecasting model. And this is allowed, can then drive some regional scale models over specific regions. And this allows these regional scale models to provide uh, forecasts of air quality. And you can download uh, uh, an app for your phone, for instance. This is an example from the Weather Underground uh, app uh, showing, for instance, in this case, uh, moderate air quality over Boulder. And this is driven by the uh, by the information provided by this Copernicus system. So when you look at these apps, you're actually uh, having the benefit of some of these satellite measurements informing your decisions. And so this is an example of, of how satellite data is used in that, uh, used for forecasting. Um, so you have Moppet observations on the, the left, and those were from uh, during these fires last summer. Um, and you can see on the right of the forecast that used those observations. This is for surface level carbon monoxide. And <clears throat> so this is a process called data assimilation, data assimilation. <laughs> um, and in the, in the case of Moppet, you have some gaps in the data, but what that the model does is fill in those gaps, but it's informed by the data that it does have. So now uh, we're getting into, we're almost to the end and we wanna tell you about what comes next. So but before we actually do that, we also thought it'd be interesting to tell you a little bit about how we develop a new, new satellite mission. This is an activity that both Helen and I have been involved in, in during our careers. And we thought we'd just step through some of the, some of the steps that we uh, go through to uh, produce these rather expensive uh, uh, satellites uh, to fly and tell us about our air quality. So to start off with, the first part is that we need to motivate. We need a science question or an application need. And that might be a question like, we need to be able to make better health advisories uh, for air quality. Uh, and it's based on community input. And that comes from often convening uh, expert panels or so going out into the community and asking uh, particular stakeholders, what do they need? What observations do they need? And this helps us come up with the observables that have to be measured. What exactly are they? Are they? Where, we, where are we gonna measure them? When and how well do we need to measure them in order to be able to answer the questions we want to answer? So then we get to the design phase and there, there you have to identify candidate technologies to make the measurement um, and you have to make some requirements and you come up with an engineering design to meet those requirements, uh, which in this case, we're showing a CAD drawing for the Kronos instrument that David and I both worked on. Um, and you also have to consider the data processing approach. 
The next stage is to go build something. And often, uh, before we actually start on building uh, the, the um, satellite instrument, we could be build an aircraft instrument that's going to be able to act as a demonstrator, a, a proof of concept for what the satellite observation might look like. And here's a, just a, 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 sh a shot showing the retrievals from Veno 2 over the uh, Colorado Front Range. You can see Denver, pollution from Denver there uh, going towards the mountains. And this was a demonstration instrument called Geotasso, which was built by Ball Aerospace here in Boulder, uh, which flew on aircraft as a, as a trying to demonstrate the kind of cover bridge and the seamless coverage that we were going to get from the geostationary satellites that we're going to talk about next. And the good thing about this is, although Helen and I are unlikely to be astronauts, we can sometimes fly on the aircraft when they're when these um, instruments are, are, are flying uh, so that we can uh, check, check out the performance and see if they, we think that they're going to be uh, suitable for the uh, and have the same performance that we need for the satellites. After, after the um, uh, aircraft instruments, uh, the next stage is to build a, a satellite instrument to the required uh, specifications. And here's a photograph of the Tropomi instrument uh, in the clean room before launch. Uh, these instruments then have to go through a very intensive calibration and testing. They get shaken around to make sure that they're not going to fall apart on launch. And we also have to develop the data processing infrastructure that's going to deal with all the data download and also the uh, processing of the data and all the things that, that Helen talked about in doing retrievals and the like. Uh, finally, the uh, instrument is uh, integrated on the satellite bus. And finally, we get to launch. And uh, after launch, you have to do a checkout of the instrument and I'll make sure that the data and the performance are good. And then we get to what we what I talked about before with data validation and checking out the accuracy of your observations. And at that point, you can then distribute the, the data and it's good for the science and applications that we've been talking about here. So in this slide, we're going to talk about a few of the uh, trends, if you like, in uh, uh, how instruments are being developed and what missions are going forward. So in, the, in addition to our US satellite missions, investigating air quality, we also have programs in Europe and Asia that we work with as well. Uh, we build satellite constellations, and this is many satellites all flying at the same time to help provide comprehensive information on many different atmospheric properties. Now, these constellations can be built through an international co cooperation with different countries providing different uh, satellites or to make become members of a constellation, or they might be multiple copies of a, of a small sat. Uh, that they're all launched together, but they can, by working together, they can achieve greater spatial and temporal coverage. Uh, commercial initiatives are becoming much more important. It's not just the big space agencies anymore, but we have partnerships with the private sector uh, for mission development and also for access to space. And just over there on, on the right is just an example of one of these small sats. This is methane sat is actually being built right now in Boulder by Ball Aerospace. Uh, this is funded by the Environmental Defense Fund, and it's a, a spectrometer plan for launch next year. And what methane sat is going to do is to measure methane in the atmosphere uh, at a very high spatial resolution. Now, we haven't talked that much about methane, but it's a very important gas because it has um, consequences for air quality. It's involved in a lot of air quality and uh, atmospheric pollution chemistry, uh, but it's also a very important uh, climate gas as well. And so the goal, uh, one of the goals of methane sat is to target the main sites around the goal, globe uh, that are responsible for the majority of the oil and gas production. Um, Tropomi was a really big leap forward for us, um, and uh, our Dutch colleagues divert, deserve a, a huge amount of um, congratulations for producing an instrument that has uh, really revolutionized the way we look at uh, uh, pollution in the atmosphere at such high resolution and which is such great coverage. Uh, but the next step is uh, the up I mean, geostationary geo missions. Um, we we're really looking forward to this. Here's a picture of what it's going to look like. We're going to have geostationary missions. And if you remember, Helen talked about geostationary missions as looking down over a particular part of the Earth 
and they orbit at such an altitude of 36,000 kilometers that they rotate with the Earth's surface and look down continually over the same area. And so we have measurements every hour, and so they can show these variations during the day. We're going to have Tempo looking down over the uh, United States, Sentinel-4 in the Looking down over Europe and the GEMS instrument looking down over Asia and GEMS in fact was has already been launched. Now these ge geostationary satellites are going to uh, uh, be in constellation again with the uh, low earth orbit uh, instruments that we've got such as Tropomi and these are going to have the capability of tying the measurements if you like between the two the, between the three geostationary areas. Uh, because these uh, missions all have common objectives and they're working in this constellation framework, they're going to provide us with this brand new global perspective and an unprecedented capability to meet the needs of air quality research and applications. So this animation of tropospheric ozone shows how the constellation of geostationary and low Earth polar orbit satellites that David just described will work together. We have the view over the USA from Tempo, which used to be called GeoCape, with pollution changing from day into night. And then we have the Sentinel-4 view over Europe with a polar orbiter is zipping around that can observe the pollution that's transported all around the globe, tying those observations from say North America to Europe and then to Asia. And that's the GEMS view over Asia that we're gonna talk a little bit more about So the GEMS uh, spectrometer was launched by South Korea in February 2020 from the Guiana Space Center. And that uh, shows a nice launch there. The instrument was built by Ball in Boulder, by Ball Aerospace, which is also building its sister instrument, Tempo. And GEMS is the first satellite instrument in the geoconstellation that David was talking about. And it's already producing some exciting results. So this is... Um, a picture, uh, an animation of aerosol, optical depth from GEMS. And uh, this shows hourly views over two days. So each frame there is an hourly observation. And GEMS requires sunlight for the measurements. So the progression is westward. And you can see the higher particulate pollution in Beijing and then also in Northwest India over those uh, two days. And so now we've, um, we've arrived at our last slide and uh, before we to put down a few final thoughts, we hope we've uh, explained uh, enough about uh, air quality in the atmosphere and the role of satellites uh, to convince you that air quality is an important, pro uh, thing, uh, uh, important topic to, for us to study. The processes emitting the pollution, how the, these move around in the atmosphere and what chemical and physical transformations take place and how it finally affects uh, the air we breathe and our health. Definitely over the last uh, couple of decades, We've, we've been provided with some amazing satellite measurements of pollutants in the atmosphere. And this has really improved our understanding. And these satellite data are routinely now compared and integrated in atmospheric models uh, to improve the models themselves, improve our uh, representation of our understanding, and also to make predictions. So these uh, advances have been made using low Earth orbit measurements mostly. And they've, um, they take measurements on the sort of continental to global and the weekly to seasonal scales. But the new uh, geostationary perspective with high spatial resolution and hourly measurements uh, will be uh, a big leap forward. And it's essential for understanding processes at the local scale, so like an urban area, and also for providing uh, input to air quality forecasts and management. And we are hoping that the measurements from geostationary will be as revolutionary as a uh, for air quality as they have been for improving weather forecasts. And with that, it just uh, remains for us to thank you very much. I hope you found this interesting. And we would also like to thank uh, NCAR and also our funding agencies at the National Science Foundation and NASA. And definitely uh, thank all our US and international collaborators and partners for their contributions in one way or another to the material okay. that we presented in this we talk. We stole a lot of stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> this is great. Thank you so much, Helen and David, for, for sharing all this knowledge with us. Um, 
couple of quick, quick updates. So again, if you have any questions from the audience, definitely join the Slido platform. So you, you can uh, ask Helen and David your questions. And to, to Karen's quick question, uh, this, yes, the, the recording of this presentation will be available uh, shortly, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. So getting right to the questions, maybe starting uh, first with Alyssa's, and this builds nicely off of your discussion about the, the methane sat uh, instrument. Um, can you detect methane links, leaks from satellites? So you, you talked a little bit about oil and gas infrastructure, but maybe could you detect methane leaks from like a home or a business, like a smaller scale one? Um, and then also, who decides what to name the satellites? <laughs> Uh, well, it, it depends on the size of the leak. I mean, uh, what was the resolution for methane set? Like a it's it's sub kilometer. There are there are uh, some satellites flying at the moment. There's the greenhouse gas sat, which is a commercial venture, and they're going to be they're providing. Um, That's fifty meters, uh, right? They're providing information to oil and gas uh, concerns so that they can detect leaks and make sure that uh, they're not leaking uh, methane from these uh, uh, oil and gas, uh, from these um, gas, um, particularly gas uh, uh, extraction facilities, because uh, if, we, if we're losing methane from the, from the uh, extraction itself, then obviously this is not only a waste of money uh, for the oil, from the oil, for the gas company, uh, but also this is uh, contributing to uh, climate change as well, because it's a, methane is a very strong uh, greenhouse gas. And I should point out that, uh, that, that um, which one is the, 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 the one that David was just describing, uh, yeah, has to be pointed. And so it has to know where to look. And one of the roles of Trobomi has been to figure out if it does see a big methane signature that's not expected, it can sort of direct where to point these other ones. So that's a good example of how satellites can work together for this. And who, does, who, who decides what to name the satellites? Um, you probably noticed during this talk that there are a huge number of acronyms uh, floating around. And we often have second order acronyms, acronyms of acronyms. Uh, but people spend quite some time trying to come up with a catchy name for a satellite, and uh, uh, we've been involved in this. It's uh, often it's just trying to get uh, build an acronym that describes really what you want to do. But usually, the person who gets to to name it is uh, the principal investigator who who proposes the satellite in the first place. Great. And our next question is from Peter Nell, who's asking, did you consider using the Crosstrack infrared sounder for NH3 or ammonia? Uh, so speaking of satellites that work together, you know, these satellites uh, fly in close formation with Tropomi. Yes. And in fact, we didn't, we didn't include Chris because we just had so much material, but I actually do work on Chris and Chris does observe uh, ammonia. And so we are looking at ammonia from fires, for example. And we're also looking at how uh, to take the um, observations. So like Peter Nell is saying, they're within about five minutes of each other and how you might combine those observations to give you even more information. And just for everybody's information, Peter Nell happens to be the principal investigator of the OMI instrument and a co-principal investigator of the TROPOMI instrument and has uh, recently joined NCAR as the new director of the Atmospheric Chemistry Lab. Hi, Peter now. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for being here. <laughs> um, great. So our next question comes from Ben. And this this builds off of those photos you were showing, right? Of you know, New York City with horrible air pollution from fires thousands of miles away. So what uh, approximately what proportion of pollution in the US and Canada carries over from China and India? So yeah, well, that's good. Well, it depends on which it really depends on what pollution what pollutant we're talking about, uh, because different pollutants have uh, different lifetimes in the atmosphere. Uh, some of them like carbon monoxide uh, can last for weeks. And so we can often see a buildup uh, if, uh, if, if there's a lot of sources of say carbon monoxide, it can build up, especially during the winter months, and it can a lot of it can uh, a lot of it can uh, pass from one from one uh, continent to another continent, just because it uh, has a long lifetime in the atmosphere. Aerosols often have a, 
um, a lifetime of days uh, to a week or something. And so it depends on the transport times. Uh, how long is it going to take the uh, particular pollutant to get from one continent to the next continent? And how does that relate to the, uh, uh, to the lifetime of the, uh, of the particular pollutant we're interested in? But, so it, it depends. Yeah, but whether or not it gets to the surface depends on the weather. So it's usually transported um, higher in the troposphere. And uh, a lot of times it just stays there and then eventually is uh, chemically destroyed. But if, it, if the weather conditions are um, such that, that it'll bring air down from that part of the troposphere, then you can get it at the surface. And that's what we saw on that day uh, this, this summer, July 20th, that the, those fire plumes really did come back down to the surface that day. Great, and our next question comes from Curious. Um, and, and this is a great question because it really gets at kind of the interconnectedness of all of our earth systems. So does wildfire smoke affect plant growth? That, that's a very interesting question. And I can't say that I know off the top, but uh, we do know that pollution does affect plant growth in general, and especially ozone, as we saw earlier, um, has a big uh, effect on crops. And to the extent that Ozone, uh, wildfire smoke does contribute to, to ozone along with everything else locally, um, you know, it, it could, but I'm not really sure about uh, smoke itself. I know that it's going to affect sunlight, for example. So that's one thing, but uh, I'm not sure about, you know, whether it will uh, cause harm to the plants. Which worries them. Yeah, definitely. Um, and this also kind of ties in with our, you know, our ozone garden up at the, the Mesa lab for anybody that is ever able to, you know, visit our, our buildings, uh, which unfortunately are currently still closed to the public, but the garden's outside at least. <laughs> um, so as we wait for some more questions to pop in, I'm curious, how did the two of you become interested in this line of work? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my background is actually high energy physics and, uh, I, I guess uh, started counting photons then, so still doing that. <laughs> no, I, I, um, um, I guess I had been interested in satellites since I was an undergrad here at in University of Colorado. I worked at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics and worked on a, a Pioneer Venus. So that was a satellite that orbited Venus. So I guess that was the initial start for me. And for me as well, I came from a different uh, background. I was a physicist working on, uh, in fact, nuclear fusion, but looking at how uh, radiation passes through nu nuclear fusion plasmas. And uh, I eventually ended up changing fields somewhat and getting a job looking at how radiation passes through the atmosphere. Uh, and so that led on to working with uh, different satellite programs. Uh, so that was... It's interesting, we both came from different backgrounds and uh, we're both physicists, but ended up uh, working in, yeah. uh, in this field. Physicists can do just about anything badly. <laughs> it is, it's a great point though, that I think a lot of us in the earth sciences have come from other disciplines because I was also a physicist and I ended up in geophysics. So um, great, our next question is from Jane. So if pollutants can be chemically destroyed in the troposphere, does that mean we could potentially destroy pollutants before they return to the atmosphere? Well, that's a great question. I mean, what comes to mind is a uh, catalytic converters. That's something that already is, is doing that. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's what, uh, you know, new technology is, is looking into, um, how we make those better. Uh, for example, how you do that with diesel trucks I mean, they do have a form of catalytic converter, but it's uh, something that could be improved. I think in general, I mean, taking the idea of catalytic converter or a scrubber that they stick on the top of uh, uh, emissions from a yeah, that's, from a smoke sack. That's it's how a, sulfur dioxide it's is. A, been it's a similar, a similar idea that we're using chemistry to uh, have the emission of a particular um, of a particular gas that we don't want to get into the atmosphere. Atmosphere. And by having that gas run over uh, other compounds that can chemically react with it and remove it from uh, the effluent that will find its way into the atmosphere, that's where we can clean up our emissions, definitely. 
Great, and our next question comes from Curious, who's interested if uh, forest mitigation is even possible with all the forest land that's in our country. So I, I'm, I guess I'm not quite clear what forest mitigation that would, that, do you think that would be like? Um... I'm gonna assume it's kind of the way we can, you know, help reduce wildfires. Um, so, uh, like controlled burns, maybe um, that's something that gets rid of a lot of the undergrowth in the forest without burning down the tall trees. Um, and but there's also talk of like you were saying, forest mitigation is a is a aspect of uh, climate change. You know, just uh, planting more trees to uptake the carbon, um, and maybe that's what they're talking about. And that is something you'd have to consider. And that is is would it contribute to fires? So. And following on from that, I mean, the deforestation that takes place in some places, especially like the Amazon, uh, is doubly bad because it's not only producing a fire, which is uh, taking is uh, a fire is re re releasing the carbon that is held in the trees uh, into the atmosphere, but it's also destroying those trees and their ability then to absorb the carbon that was right. previously in the atmosphere. So it's kind of a double whammy when we burn, uh, when we deforest. And then a lot of those older trees don't ever grow back, like David was saying, they, you know, it's changed the, the ecosystem. Great, our next question comes from Andre. Can the increase in pollution be the reason uh, to the dramatic climate changes that have occurred in many places? Um, or maybe so, one of the reasons. <laughs> I mean, obviously emissions, uh, man-made emissions are contributing to climate change. And so you have carbon dioxide, which is not really uh, considered an air pollutant. It's not really that harmful for, for us to breathe, of course, at least not out in, outside. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, you have all of the other pollutions that uh, pollution sources that go with it, and they have definitely um, contributed. I mean, for example, um, you know, there's there's usually a complex role. Like some aerosols uh, reflect sunlight, actually, but other ones absorb it. So it's a complicated um, climate and in, in air quality are a complicated problem, but that's why we really need to understand all the sources and emissions. But uh, there's a lot of research that uh, is going on in, in our lab, as well as in NCAR and other labs, uh, to look at these uh, relationships between, uh, between climate and uh, the imp impact of uh, chemistry on that climate. So it could be everything from just looking at the direct carbon emissions, uh, that, that Helen mentioned, uh, methane is a very good example uh, from different, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gas that's involved in a lot of uh, ozone chemistry, uh, can produce o o ozone for instance, but it's also uh, a very strong greenhouse gas. And so uh, we're looking at a lot of different processes that produce methane from both a, an air quality point of view and also a climate point of view. And then there are other gases that are involved in the production of ozone. Ozone itself uh, uh, can be a greenhouse gas um, in, in some parts of the atmosphere. And it's, um, uh, that's produced as a result of different balances between different primary emissions of pollutants. And so this gets really complicated pretty quickly, but that's one of the reasons why we develop uh, these big complex models that allow us uh, such as some of the big models, the big climate models that we run here at NCAR for the community. And we try and put chemistry within those models so that we can look at the effect of these different emissions on the climate system. So building on your physics background, Alyssa's got a, got a, a physics question for y'all. Um, so each greenhouse gas emits energy, right? At different wavelengths. So the satellites can distinguish different gases by their wavelength. And then her follow-up question was, what part of the electrobatic spectrum do the gases fall into? Is it infrared, uh, near infrared, et cetera? Great question. Uh, um, go ahead. Um, so, so first of all, yeah. So greenhouse gases absorb energy in the atmosphere and then re-emit it towards the surface. And that's why we have that, that um, greenhouse warming. Um, but we're 
we're looking at this absorption in all parts of the spectrum. So uh, the infrared is where the warming usually occurs. Um, and then in the short wave, you have more reflection to, to space. Um, but I think, can you go back to the question? Sorry, that was sort of. Well, I, th I think the, uh, the answer as Helen says is that we, we measure different gases uh, have their specific spectral signatures in different parts of the, uh, of, of the electromagnetic spectrum. So it often depends which gas uh, we want to measure is which part of the electromagnetic spectrum we choose to sample. Now, uh, the converse is also true that there are gases out there, pollutant gases out there that we would love to measure, but if they don't have a strong enough uh, spectral signature in, in some part of the, uh, uh, the spectrum, or, um, well, they don't, have a, they don't have a signature at all, or it's not strong enough, then we can't measure it. And so that's why we're limited uh, to a particular uh, handful of gases that we can measure from space and other ones we can't, although we'd love to, which comes down to another reason why we're always going to need a mix of different uh, observational techniques. Not only satellites can provide one piece of the information, but we're also going to need instruments that can go out and fly on, uh, fly on aircraft perhaps, or people to go out and take um, samples of air and use different techniques that can measure the pollutants in those samples. So we, we are really reliant on the mix of these different, uh, these different techniques in order to be able to look at all the different uh, pollutants we might be wanting to look at. Great. And in, in the last two minutes that we have together, uh, for you know, for maybe all of our students that are watching us today, do you have any advice on maybe like coursework or folks they could be talking to or programs they could look into if they're interested in you know pursuing a career in in the research that y'all do? Um, math and physics. <laughs> so, uh, but I think just any any sort of uh, STEM field, so science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, uh, can contribute to this sort of work? So, and, I mean, definitely environmental research is, uh, you know, it's increasingly important for us as a species and for our environment. Um, and so, you know, we would certainly encourage any students out there or any people who are interested in the kind of work we do to concentrate on these uh, perhaps harder subjects from the school, math, physics, chemistry, biology, the, the science subjects. And then also check out uh, different areas, different different labs or organizations. There's a host of uh, material out on the web. Uh, NASA, for instance, have some incredible websites. NCAR has some incredible websites that you can go and find so lots of information. And, and try to get internships too. Internships in are a good idea. If you find something interesting, often, uh, uh, people have got their profiles on the on the web. If anybody calls me up and wants uh, advice on uh, careers or anything in science, Helen's exactly the same as as are most of the scientists at NCAR. We're very happy to uh, give advice and uh, provide mentorship where we can. Fantastic. And with that, Helen and David, thank you so much for being here today uh, to really just chat with us about, you know, satellites and air quality and all the really, really cool stuff that you do. Uh, and also a big, big shout out to the team behind the scenes. So we got Paul, Brett, Aliyah, and Alyssa for supporting the event today. And if you're interested in more NCAR Explorer Series events, definitely check out our website for upcoming lectures, as well as uh, recordings of our past events. So with that, I hope to see you all next time, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.